So welcome to uh, this lab uh, webinar. And I really hope that uh, you'll support us by becoming a member. Your lab membership supports live webinars just like this one, which are available to members via Zoom and to non-members via YouTube, and they are recorded afterwards. Uh, we have more than 50 recorded webinars that you can go onto our website and look at the webinar and click on um, the little recording at the bottom, or you can go to our YouTube channel and see our recorded webinar. We also uh, have uh, done various uh, field ornithology projects. And if you go to our website, labirders.org and click on the science tab, you'll see some of these projects. Um, we, we are, we've done a trial uh, winter bird atlas um, gearing up towards a larger um, bird atlas sometime in the future. Um, and we've done projects on other things like, um, like, like sagebrush and uh, bell sparrows and trying to tell those apart and trying to figure out which one of those are in uh, LA County. And so our uh, speakers tonight are John Dunn and Kimball Garrett. And to introduce them, I'm going to introduce Lance Benner, um, who is uh, on the board of, of uh, LA Birders and leads field trips and does uh, manages a lot, most of the science uh, um, projects that we have and is doing a trip on this uh, July 30th that you should come and check out on the website. So Lance. All right, thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> so Los Angeles birders are very pleased to welcome back John and Kimball. Um, Kimball and John are very well known to all of us. They're two of North America's most accomplished birders. Uh, they're both top-notch field ornithologists and, and authorities on just about everything regarding birds. Um, uh, Kimball uh, recently retired from the uh, Los Angeles County Natural History Museum, uh, where he was the ornithology collections manager since 1982. Um, John is a senior tour leader with uh, Wings Birding Tours and is the current president of Western Field Ornithologists. Uh, John and Kimball have authored a number of books together, including uh, Birds of Southern California, Status and Distribution, uh, which came out, I think, in 1981, uh, Birds of the Los Angeles Region, and A Field Guide to Warblers of North America. Um, tonight, John and Kimball are going to uh, help us sort out some of the identification issues uh, posed by confusing uh, juvenile sparrows, uh, the different timing of post-juvenile molt, and for some geographically variable, variable species, they will also explore subspecies issues and distributional boundaries and species level taxonomy issues. Um, and if we have time, they might even go into some other identification status and distribution issues by, you know, posed by our, our North American sparrows. So uh, please, uh, let's uh, give them a warm welcome um, for their presentation tonight, uh, John Dunn and Kimball Garrett. Let's start this up here. Okay. We're both here. John, you there? Hello. Hi. Yeah. So, hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see my screen. I want to give just a little bit of background and then John and I are going to do sort of a tag team approach of talking about some issues posed by juvenile sparrows and when and where they move and where you have to be aware of them and some other topics too. So um, I'm calling the, we're calling this summer and fall sparrow topics with special attention to delinquent juvenile sparrows. And I just wanted to back up for a second. You know, the LA Birders was born in part because COVID pretty much put the kibosh on a regular monthly get together that Los Angeles area birders had for many, many years, actually for decades. And there would be very informal presentations each month at those meetings. Um, presentations, not only informal, but usually after a few glasses of wine and a lot of socializing. And little did we know that LA birders would really blossom and evolve into you know, pretty much some state-of-the-art presentations by researchers, by ornithologists, by people, experts in field identification and, and so on. And there's been just a fantastic suite of programs. 
So what we're doing tonight is kind of um, going back sort of retrograde here to the um, few glasses of wine informal topics type approach um, and talk, talk about some things that we wanted to get across regarding how we can get confused by juvenile sparrows and, and so on. And so it's not hardcore research, it's just some common sense identification issues that we wanted to get across. And also you can't disentangle identification issues from status and distribution issues. So of course, we'll be talking about that as well. And so um, first we wanna just um, give you a little bit of background and then we'll launch into some birds themselves. John, did you wanna say anything else at the outset before we really launch into this? Did we gonna identify the first slide, Kimball? Oh, did I have to do that? I just found a sparrow slide that I had taken, but this is not a bird you're likely to see in California or the continental US. And it's a bird you'd have to travel to Cuba to see. It's uh, the variously known as the um, Zapata sparrow or the Cuban sparrow, but just emblematic of the new world sparrows of the family Passerellidae. Um, and I just thought that it's kind of a neat bird. So I'd start with that instead of some boring California sparrow. All right, Davis thanks for Pop that. I forgot all about it. So first of all, just a couple of terms. Um, technically, and for the longest time in ornithological literature, the word juvenile was used as an adjective to describe aspects of juvenile birds. So juvenile is really a noun, a bird is a juvenile or it's in its you know, first um, brief period of, of life. Um, I've, we kind of argued about the proper use of juvenile as an adjective versus juvenile. And we've, we've pretty lo much lost the argument and most books, most journals and things nowadays are pretty much just throwing in the towel and using only the term juvenile. So we will continue to use it the way we have sort of learned it, but um, just keep in mind that these are essentially now interchangeable terms. And one of the common themes tonight will be how long is this juvenile plumage, or in other words, the plumage worn by juveniles, how long is it retained? Is it very, very brief before they perform their what's called the preformative mold into formative plumage, or what we always learned as the first basic plumage? Um, or is it retained much longer than that? And that's an important distinction or an important um, sort of sliding scale that we'll be talking about. And it's uh, the New World sparrows and the family Passerellidae are variable in this regard. Some species you're really not likely to see in their juvenile plumage unless you're right there on the breeding grounds. Others will migrate or disperse in that juvenile plumage and you may be seeing them hundreds of miles from their breeding grounds. So, that's a distinction we wanted to make. So some of the characteristics of juvenile plumage, I mean, in general, juvenile plumage is more lax, kind of fluffy, just doesn't look quite as well organized. It's a little looser. Uh, the flight feathers tend to be weaker. The tail feathers tend to be narrower. So these are common themes of juvenile plumages. And in most of the New World, in many at least, of the New World nine primary Ocene families, and remember that's a group of songbirds primarily in the New World that are all closely related to each other, but classified in several different related families, um, including some of our most familiar birds like our uh, New World sparrows, our warblers, our the tanagers, the cardinals, the um, icterids, and so on. In many of those families, the juvenile plumage tends to be more streaked than in subsequent plumages. So we'll be talking a lot about streaking tonight. And I don't mean streaking in the sense of back in the 70s and 80s when it was popular to take off your clothes and run through sporting events or the Oscars or other uh, public events. And that was known as streaking. But the streaking we're talking about is actual pigment and feathers uh, aligned in a, a series of long rows that we think of as streaks. So streaky juveniles are really prevalent in the passerellidae of the New World sparrows. Um, in almost all cases, juveniles are more streaked than adults, um, or if the adults are streaked, juveniles are even more streaked, or they have streaks where the adults lack them. 
Um, John will talk a little later about Henslow Sparrow, which is, is an exception where the juveniles are actually less streaked, but that's not something we generally have to worry about here on the West Coast. So streaky juveniles are also prevalent in the old world bunting family, the Emberizidae, which um, in the recent years has been split from the New World Sparrows. So uh, we now call ours the Passerellidae and the Emberizids are restricted to the old world buntings, which are very sparrow-like and the juveniles are streaked. Also in most of the Cardinality, the Cardinals, Grosbeaks and buntings and so on, the juveniles are streaked where the adults are not. And keep in mind that the cardinality includes the birds that we call tanagers here, Western, Scarlet, Summer, Hepatic, and so on, their relatives, which in fact are cardinals. They're closely related to the cardinals and grosbeaks rather than the true tanagers of the neotropics. Uh, so those tend to be really streaky. And the perulids, the new world warblers, in most species, the juveniles are show more streaking than the, than the adults or show streaks when the adults do not. There are many exceptions. Streaky juveniles are much rarer in the icterids and pretty much largely absent in the true tanagers or the thraupidae, except in cases where the adults are also streaked, in which case juveniles might be as well. So just a bit about streakiness and juvenility. Um, Again, the juvenile plumage can be very, very briefly held. And in fact, some wood warblers like the American Red Start actually begin their molt into their formative plumage or first fall plumage before they even leave the nest, which makes you kind of wonder about the evolutionary um, adaptation of having a juvenile molting in a, a suite of feathers that are only carried for really just a couple of weeks before they're replaced. But in other groups of birds, the juvenile plumage may be retained for a long time, through the first fall or even through most of the first year. So that's not true um, of New World sparrows, at least through the entire first year. But we'll talk about some, some groups in which that's the case. And then again, within the New World sparrows, it really varies from juvenile plumage, which is brief enough that you're only likely to see it on the breeding grounds in which case your best identification clues are often just identifying whatever bird is shoving food into the beak of the streaky juvenile. Um, but there are other species where it's carried well into the fall, including after these birds have dispersed or migrated from their breeding ground. So we'll be talking uh, quite a bit about those distinctions. So just a couple of quick examples before we launch into New World Sparrows. Uh, here's a bird in a plumage it's one of our most familiar birds, but it's a plumage that's probably not familiar to most of you. This is an Audubon's or yellow rump warbler, just a couple of different individuals. Very, very streaky. They molt out of this plumage before they migrate any significant distance. Um, you can't see it, but they also, they lack the yellow rump in this plumage. So it's really confusing. But again, they're on the breeding grounds only in this plumage, and they're likely to be associating with the easily identified adults. So here's just a case of an unfamiliar juvenile plumage, unless you happen to bird a lot right where they breed in the higher mountains. Just another bird that we're pretty familiar with in the right seasons and places, but really bizarre looking juveniles. This is a juvenile yellow-headed blackbird. Um, really buffy and black with wing bars. It really has, bears little resemblance to adults of either sex. And again, you'll only see this on the breeding grounds. So not too tough an ID because it's going to be hanging out with adults that are shoving food down its beak, or, or at least wishes they would. But then there's a whole other series of families of birds in which juvenile plumage is retained through much of their first year. So for example, in our larger gulls like this western gull, um, the juvenile plumage is only partially replaced through the first uh, fall and winter, or first winter. So they're bearing a lot of that same plumage through most of their first year. A Cooper's hawk here in the middle, this is a juvenile, and it's gonna wear that plumage essentially through its first year. And over on the right is an example of a group of birds, the sapsuckers, where the length um, of retention of juvenile plumage is important for field identification. This is a yellow-bellied sapsucker photographed actually in LA County in late November still largely in juvenile plumage. It's got the juvenile modeled under parts. Uh, it is growing in some adult-like head patterning, but often they won't really complete that till 
well toward the end of the first winter or into the first spring, whereas our other two similar sapsucker species, red-breasted and red-naped, have molted much farther into their formative plumage or more adult-like plumage by late fall. And so it's a good case or a good example of a case where I, uh, identification hinges in part on the length of retention of juvenile plumage. So this is also really important in shorebirds. So John's gonna talk just briefly about some shorebirds too. Right, well, shorebirds are perhaps my favorite group, multiple families, uh, even though I generally am a passerine person, but uh, we see shorebirds in three distinctive plumages, the breeding adult, both going north and coming south, basic plumage, and the juvenile plumage. And uh, for most species, the adults come south in their breeding plumage and the juveniles come south in their juvenile plumage, typically a month or so after the adults. And when both near reach the winter grounds in most species, they molt into a basic-like plumage. So this is a really fresh and bright uh, juvenile Western sandpiper. Uh, adults have been coming through for, oh, three, three and a half weeks. And juveniles, so by the end of, certainly the end of next week, if not a little earlier, the first juveniles come south. And uh, they migrate south in that plumage through much of August. And after about the 10th of August, at places like uh, the Paiute Ponds, where they don't winter, uh, after about August 10, virtually all the Westerns you see are juveniles, or the great majority are juveniles. And then, uh, uh, so if you look at the fall migration of Western Sandpiper, it's from the very end of June till the middle of October, but it, you're dealing with two different age groups, adults, uh, for the first month and then overwhelmingly juveniles, the last few in uh, mid-October. You can see all the feathers are bright and fresh. The, I can't remember if Kimball mentioned it or not, but uh, the post-juvenile molt can be extensive in, um, or it is quite extensive in, in most birds, um, ex except when held like raptors, uh, but the wing and tail it is retained through the first year of life. Next image. So oh, the Western here, let me. The Western fits the example. Uh, it's a calidris for almost all of the shorebirds. And then you get something really interesting uh, the Dunlin, which is a circumpolar breeding species with 10 named subspecies. Uh, of which four occur regularly in North America. Um, and two of which, or one of which is a migrant from Asia. And one of which breeds in Northern Alaska and winters in Asia. But uh, Dunland is a bit of an exception. We see them in spring migration going north in their breeding plumage like the lower left figure. Uh, but when the adults come back, they don't come back till September and they're already in their basic like plumage like the one in the upper left. So we won't see a migrant Dunlin for two months. And when they finally appear towards the end of September, they look like the upper left bird. And for that matter, so do the juveniles. Uh, they stay up north and go through a post juvenile molt and we see them looking the adults and juveniles, which are now first basic or formative plumage, uh, come south in um, uh, a, dull, a dull plumage. And that's true for the great majority, except for um, the Euro two European subspecies, at least two, uh, Shinzi, which breeds from the UK and through the Baltic region, and Arctica, which is smaller breeding in Northeast Greenland. Uh, they migrate through and breeding plumage, the adults in the fall, as do the juveniles and they winter in, for the most part, Northwest to West Africa. Um, so what does that mean? Two different 
malt sequences. So nothing is ever simple. There are exceptions and you just kind of need to remember that. And perhaps there are more, um, uh, there's more than one species of Dunlin involved. Uh, notice the one on the lower right, that's probably Hudsonia, a juvenile. Um, and a few birds have turned up oh, from east of Toronto to the maritime provinces of Canada in uh, juvenile plumage, juvenile plumage, um, which I've, not, I've never seen with our Dunlin Pacifica. Our Dunlin Pacifica happens to be the largest and longest build subspecies. Uh, they, Dunlin breeds in Alaska, south of Arcticola. They stage and molt in the Yukon Kuskokwim Deltas. The Arcticolas wave goodbye to the Pacificas and go to China. The Pacificas cross the um, Pacific Gulf of Alaska and winter down our west coast. Next image. Okay, well now we're gonna get into the, the real meat of the what we wanna talk about today and that's um, issues posed by juvenile sparrows and just some other issues related to sparrow status and distribution. So one of our most familiar sparrows through much of much of North America, that's certainly true in, in Southern California, is the song sparrow, widespread breeder in the lowlands and foothills and riparian situations, but also parks and gardens and river bottoms and brushy wet areas and marshes and so on. So uh, pretty typical looking bird in, in summer over on the right here with very black spotting and streaking. The left hand bird, which is photographed in basically near downtown LA, looks a little a uh, little different, probably in part because it's a winter bird and very fresh plumage, but it's also possible it's a migratory subspecies rather than our resident one. But but you're all pretty familiar with adult song sparrows, and although there's tremendous geographical variation, uh, most birds you're going to see in coastal Southern California are going to look pretty much like these or like the bird on the right. So then, of course, we have another very common Melispiza sparrow. The Lincoln Sparrow, which is a fall migrant, a wintering bird, and a spring migrant in Southern California, but breeds only very, very locally in a few high montane meadows that are full of things like um, corn lily and so on, a little bit of willows and stuff. So just a couple breeding spots in LA County, for example, up around Big Pines and some of the other springs up there. But Lincolns are very common in winter. Um, they can be a common migrant on the deserts in spring, even places where you don't see them in winter, but you're generally not going to see them before early September. And in fact, you're not going to really count on seeing them in any numbers until uh, probably third week of September or so. And likewise, in spring, they're largely gone by April, by the end of April, with only a very few birds straggling through into May. And so that brings up an issue that's posed by juvenile sparrows. We see a lot of these. Now this is a bird photographed up in Marin County. So it's not the same subspecies you'd see in LA, but this is a juvenile song sparrow. Very different from the adults, much finer streaking below and often quite a buffy wash to them. This is a Marin County bird. Here's one of getting a little closer in Monterey County. Again, fine breast streaking, kind of an arching gray eyebrow, buffy background to the chest, buffy mailer and so on. Um, and finally, here's another one uh, more locally in, in Southern California on the coastal slope. A juvenile song sparrow, again, buffy wash across the breast with fine streaking. I can't tell you as an eBird reviewer how many times we have had to alert eBirders to the fact that there are entries of Lincoln sparrows in late May and June and so on in the lowlands almost certainly pertain to juvenile song sparrows. Um, it's just a bird you really want to learn. And it's a common bird. You can see juveniles as early as late April and as late in the year as probably August. And um, so they're not that hard to study. Anywhere where song sparrows breed in the spring, you're going to see these juveniles. And as always, the accompanying adults are a very good clue 
to identification, but also notice some other things. So when we compare this to a Lincoln's, for example, the streaking is much more restricted across the breast. Um, it's not long, fine rows of streaks that go all the way down through the flanks. The buffy is really a little different in extent. The, it doesn't have that neat uh, kind of colorful crown contrasting with that arched gray supercilium. It's a lot more muted, the head patterning. Um, if it's got a hint of the yellow gape, it's probably going to be a juvenile as well, of course. So this is just something to be really aware of. I know most people have, have learned this. They probably even made the mistake at one point in their life. But uh, there's still a lot of birders who need to understand that these juvenile song sparrows are not Lincoln sparrows, but look very much like them. So that's just lesson number one. Do keep that in mind. I think on average, song sparrows have a somewhat larger bill, somewhat longer tail. Uh, they sound very different, and although we're not demonstrating and talking much about vocalizations, that's always a good clue. If you've got a juvenile song sparrow around, the adults are going to come mobbing in and giving all their calls, which are very, very different from the calls of Lincoln sparrows. So having said all that, I'm not sure how well versed uh, John and I really are in the identification of juvenile song versus juvenile Lincoln sparrows. Um, that's not something you have to worry about in, in Southern California, except perhaps in a very few montane meadow situations where Lincoln's breed and you might also have breeding song sparrows. This bird was photographed in Nevada um, and the question was posed, is this a juvenile song or a juvenile Lincoln's? Now keep in mind, once you get up into places like the Sierra Nevada, some of those higher mountain meadows will have both of them. So frankly, John and I are not really willing to put a name on this bird. Um, this juvenile songs and Lincolns are very similar to one another in, in plumage. Um, we would probably opt to pay a lot of attention to vocalizations and what kind of adults are around it. We don't have that information for this individual. So again, telling the juveniles of the two species apart is difficult but it's not a problem we encounter in lowland Southern California. Uh, so again, the point is juvenile song versus Lincoln's is a real ID issue. Um, John, do you have any final words on what you think this bird might be? I do, I agree with we you. we don't know? I do, I, I agree with you. I, I start to lean towards um, song. And the one on the right seems to show a long tail. Um, and the streaking on the chest looks a little broad. And maybe on the back, it'd be finer perhaps than the juvenile Lincolns. And I have been in a situation in a few of those Sierra Meadows at about 5,000 feet where both species were breeding and uh, looked at them. They were interesting and challenging, but the, they were, the juveniles would get up and sit and face me and with alarm calls and the adults would come around. But it was one of those situations I thought I could spend a lot of time here studying them. <laughs> but you're not going to see a juvenile Lincolns anywhere in the lowlands of um, Southern California. So knowing the date and where you are is going to keep you out of trouble. I just was going to comment too, Kimball, looking at that uh, song sparrow from L.A. in the winter. I think that looks like Montana, which is our common wintering song sparrow in the deserts here. Just doesn't look blackish enough, too gray. The one on the left there. And it's a, a good indication that, you know, we just don't, um, there's so many song sparrows that breed on the coast that it's easy to say, oh, a song sparrow without looking at it carefully, even though others are found in the winter, other subspecies that may have come mm -hmm. from a long distance. Yeah, I encounter Montana most often out on the deserts in places where song sparrows don't breed or are very marginal. Um, and I think they probably would just get overlooked largely on the coastal slope. But again, the point with this, uh, these sparrows here, and by the way, this is just one bird, just two photographs of the same bird. But the point with this and the song and well, song and Lincoln's is you're not likely to see this plumage away from the immediate breeding grounds. So it's just an issue um, right on the breeding grounds. Uh, and most certainly the lowlands of Southern California are not the breeding grounds 
of Lincoln sparrows. So now we're going to switch to another group of sparrows where the, in some species, the juvenile plumage can be retained longer and seen away from the breeding grounds. And that's a clue to identification. So John's going to take over now for Spizellas. So the Spizella sparrows are mostly rather small species. Uh, there's small bills. They are often gregarious in winter and migration. Um, Longish tails, uh, seemingly with their size, the tails stand out as being long. And so when you were dealing with sparrows, behavior can often be an excellent clue. Chipping sparrows are most common in widespread spazella in California, um, although they tend to be rather local in the winter. And chipping sparrows um, are un a bit unusual with, with our sparrows, certainly some, there are others, but they retain the juvenile plumage uh, well into the fall and migrate in that plumage. So, uh, and the juvenile plumage is distinctly different and heavily streaked. So the adults have molted, lost their rufous crown. Uh, the bird on the right uh, could easily be a, uh, a winter adult or, or a first or formative immature. That's the way the, uh, they look in the winter. Um, breeding season, of course, they have the, the rufous crown, the bill darkens. Um, I might just point out as, as we're thinking about spazellas and the classic trio of identification, clay-colored brewers and uh, chipping, you might look at the auricular on the right-hand bird and notice that there's no um, dark mark at the edge of the auricular there on the on the by the submustachial. So there's no mustachial streak, which is a good which is something that Brewers and Clay Colored has. And also that the eye stripe goes through the eye, which you can see on these two birds. So into the lowers. So these are juvenile chipping sparrows. The juveniles you kind of see the head pattern of the adult but they're strongly streaked. Uh, this is a continent-wide species. And I've seen this plumage, oh, almost till about the 20th of October in California. And Will Russell, who lived in Maine, said that he doesn't see juvenile chipping sparrow, juvenile plumage chipping sparrows past the end of September. So maybe there's some difference in the geographical timing. You see the general structure, longish tail, little bill, and kind of the head pattern. The rump is streaked as well, which you can't quite see on this. Next image. So these are two brewer sparrows. Boy, they have a, a beautiful song, but they really are washed out and dull. But there's, you know, spazellas, little bills, long tails. Uh, you look for distinctive field marks and you grasp. Uh, they do have a, a um, more distinctive face pattern with an eye ring and palish lores marks to separate from uh, chipping. Uh, the juvenile plumage does have some streaks, but not as streaked as uh, chipping. And by the time they really get organized and start to migrate, uh, or you see a bird sparrow on the coast, you're not going to see a bird with strong streaking, like the right hand of the two on the right. So you tend to see this plumage on the breeding grounds and our sagebrush plains. And by the time they get organized and leave, and start appearing as migrants. They may retain a few streaks, but not a lot. At least with our widespread brewer eye subspecies. Next image. So we include 
couple of uh, brewers here, the nominate and show the more faintly streaked juvenile of uh, brewer eye. And, and then there's this, the Timberline Brewers, which breeds from East Central Alaska down to about Glacier National Park, the Northern Rockies. It's, it's characteristic, at, well, Timberline of the Canadian Rockies. And uh, the juvenile plumage, juvenile plumage is heavily streaked, unlike Brewer Eye. And uh, a lot of the specimens of that bird are at the ROM in uh, Toronto. Uh, which this specimen was based on. So that's every bit as heavy as a chipping sparrow, or virtually so. Notice the lores are pale. Um, but um, if you remember the article in Birding Magazine and pictures of adult timber lines, I thought, oh, no reason. No wonder I've never identified one in migration. I would have totally overlooked it. They look so similar to my eye. I've never seen uh, a juvenile, juvenile plumaged timberline in migration. So don't know if they retain that plumage. Genetically, they're, I think, about 1% different. So I suspect they have a post-juvenile molt. So they'll look much more like the adult before they go south. I think there's one specimen record for California of that taxon. Uh, the song is very slightly different. There have been... Uh, a couple of efforts to split it that hasn't been terribly successful. Timberline's a little larger. So another case where there's certainly variation in, in appearance, at least, you know, they're so similar, but yet alone the juvenile plumage is the most distinctive in separating uh, the two subspecies. Next image. That's a Tom Schultz illustration. So I decided to throw in a clay colored. This is in, uh, it's probably first fall formative plumage, maybe with a still few juvenile streaks on the side of the breast. And there's a more typical one you might see on the breeding grounds. Um, it, it surprises me to be honest that clay colored is still so widely misidentified uh, I don't consider the identification that difficult, um, particularly in fall when they're quite buffy. Uh, and I've often said a better name for it would be clay collared sparrow. So the gray collar stands out against a very warm buff plumage. They have a much stronger head pattern than a brewer's sparrow, with very dark lateral crown stripes, kind of a bulgy supercilium and a thick post-ocular line. Both brewers and clay-colored have pale lores, unlike chipping. Um, but brewers and clay-colored in particular cause a lot of identification problems. And on the coast, where both are rare in fall migration, but just about as equally as likely, particularly in September, as the fall goes on, more clay coloreds appear. So there's a timing difference. I've only once seen, I think, a clay colored in late August when brewers are routinely moving. Um, but I've had up to a half dozen clay coloreds at a time in Death Valley in mid October, or at one location in various sparrow flocks. So clay colored brewers chipping is a Troika with identification issues. Black-throateds. It would be my vote for perhaps the most beautiful sparrow in North America. Um, some seem to be short distance migrants, but it, several turn up uh, per year east of the Mississippi, even to the Canadian Maritimes. So obviously, uh, a long distance migrant and uh, astray as well. With the um, placement of sagebrush and closely related bell sparrow in its own genus, and also now uh, five stripe sparrow, uh, putting it in its own genus that leaves black throated as the sole member of the genus, Amphispisa. 
So the adults are very distinctive um, and so is the juvenile plumage, which is I think we'll see next. Yeah, there's so, just a little delay in the slides coming up. So they are, they are moving along. So totally different looking bird, heavily streaked breast, lacks the beautiful black throat, but shares the, or at least similar to the adult, the big white eyebrow, which is a very extensive behind the eye and immediately excludes any possibility of it being a juvenile bells uh, or sagebrush sparrow. And these birds, um, I saw my first one a month ago here in uh, my yard where they don't breed or sometimes they breed, but not this year. So it came from somewhere different and that was about June 18 and saw another one today. Uh, they migrate south in their juvenile plumage and I've seen birds in early October, um, still in full juvenile plumage. I think after mid-October, mid they're well on the way. They have the black throat, it may not be solid, but they're well on their way to acquiring adult plumage. So it's in its own genus. And uh, this is one of the sparrows that retains a juvenile plumage for an extended period of time. Anything you want to add, Kimball? No, I agree. They're among the most beautiful of all our sparrows and the juveniles are distinctive and a good thing to learn because this is a good example of a juvenile plumage that you're likely to see well away from the breeding areas. In fact, most of the ones that show up on the coast in late summer and fall are gonna look like this rather than adult. So it's a good plumage to learn. I think Kimball, didn't they, aren't the coastal records, they can be as early as the end of July, correct? Certainly in early August. Yeah. Certainly late, late July. So here we have, um, I assume the, the great effort continues with lab to figure out Knesset's bells, the Mojave breeding bell sparrow subspecies from sagebrush, which is split. Um, the contact zone, if anywhere, is right where I live out my door. Uh, but in general, as you head up the hill to Crowley Lake, you turn to sagebrush sparrows. And what breeds in uh, Round Valley here in the Bishop area is um, Knesset spells, or the Mojave spelled with a J, if you were to split connescence from belli. Um, as for how you identify them, I, I, your, your group has summarized the issues well. A thicker uh, mailer streak on uh, bell sparrows and a more faintly streaked back. But the best way to do it is to be able to sex them and then to measure them. The bells are smaller. But they, um, in all plumages, you'll see a sort of a white super laurel spot, but they lack the big white eyebrow. And the juvenile plumage is really a, kind of an, I don't want to call it a nothing streaky thing, but you'll see a bit of that same pale super laurel spot and uh, certainly no long extended eyebrow like a black throated. A sage, both bells and sagebrush. Uh, when you see these streaky, really streaky juvenile, juvenile plumage of any of these things, um, the knowing behavior is important. Uh, in the case of the bells and sagebrush, they run on the ground with their tails up like little thrashers, very characteristic behavior. And uh, look for the accompanying adults or adults in the in the area, sometimes still feeding birds because they fled from the nest, but haven't gone far. So this is a undoubtedly by range, uh, Belli Belli in Zuma Canyon. That's a rather scarce bird in the Santa Monica Mountains and here's birds near the coast. So you'll see, uh, no, it, they have a distinctive eye ring, which is a good identification feature and everything's so blah that the eye ring does show up. And you'll see just a hint of this pale super laurel spot 
but no broad eyebrow. Uh, you might be able to argue there's kind of the thickish appearance of a, of a um, mailer there, but here it looks rather thin. Here's another juvenile of the Mojave breeder, Canescence. How the juveniles, juvenile plumage differs between the three is uh, uh, something that obviously requires more study. Uh, all three, the juvenile plumage, once the birds fledge, they can escape and go up in elevation. Uh, so the, you know, the Mojave, the East Mojave is a pretty hot place. And so birds can go many dozens of miles into areas that have better feeding. And that sort of made things a bit confusing to determine ranges of these things. A sagebrush as well. Uh, if you go up um, oh, towards Alpine County, Markleyville, you go over Monitor Pass. And if you go there in August, you can see sagebrush sparrows, but they don't breed at Monitor Pass. So they've arrived there from somewhere. Yeah. These bell sparrows will routinely move way up into the San Gabriel Mountains after the breeding season. And that can be as early as, as mid to late May and they'll be widespread high up in montane chaparral and even over onto the coastal slope of the mountains and you'll see and after good breeding years you'll see family groups you'll see juveniles and adults together in poor breeding birds it's pretty much just the adults you'll see but generally if you see a bird like this in may june up way above their breeding elevation they'll be accompanying adults because they'll move as family groups i so saw for comparison now we've got a couple photos. I saw Lance uh, had a question uh, or a comment. The bell sparrow has four subspecies. Uh, we've talked about canescens on the Mojave and uh, belli, ominate belli on the coastal slope. It's a little complicated around the San Joaquin Valley, uh, but um, they're Clementi Eye on San Clemente Island, and I believe, is it Center Essence, Kimball, from Central Baja? Yes, um, yeah, Cenarius or what is it? Yeah. In Baja. And, and, and the, even though genetically the birds on San Clemente are much like Belli, as I recall, uh, the songs differ. So the, and Kinesin's, the Mojave bird sings differently than Belli. So a lot of work needs to be done figuring out how the songs differ between uh, one between the species, but also the variation within each species, particularly with the four named subspecies of bells. So that if I've managed to thoroughly confuse you with sagebrush and bell sparrows as I confuse myself regularly, I just go back to the juvenile plumage of each is easily separated by the face pattern, black-throated and bells, which are now in different genera. Kimball, anything to add? No, no, just again, remember the bells behaviorally run along like a thrasher and flip their tail around. Black-throated simply do not do that. I also think there's some differences. The black-throated has a larger bill often kind of bluish on the mandible and um, generally more of a peaked crown rather than rounded, although I hesitate to rely on that kind of character too much. But they're, they're pretty different if you really look in particular at that supercilium. So we got another comparative slide here. Bells on the left and black-throated on the right. So I see the... Which are the oh, bells, Kness? So they're both uh, the Mojave birds. Yeah, yeah, those are. How how close where you live in uh, Juniper Hills? How far is it to the nearest breeding bells, and how far are those from the nearest breeding uh, Mojave? Is it about ten so miles? Mojaves breed along the base of the mountains. 
uh, places like just above Pear Blossom Park and along Fort Dahone Road. And then if you're familiar with Angeles Forest Highway where it hits Mount Emma Road, which is getting more into Chamis Chaparral, that's about as far out toward the desert as the nominate bells get. So it's really only maybe four miles as the sparrow flies from the edge of one to the other. It's pretty close. That's pretty interesting. And I've been looking at some adult bells adult bells coming into my bird bath. That's why I occasionally raise my binoculars. Sorry about that. <laughs> so we're going to leave these juveniles here and move along so we don't uh, run over too much. Talk just briefly about a hodgepodge of other species and other groups, and then John will finish up with yet another uh, couple groups of sparrows. So lark sparrow is a very distinctive, familiar sparrow with that incredible head pattern. Also the uh, bold tail pattern with the white along the edges and corners. So a very familiar bird, which breeds pretty widely, although kind of locally too. Their, their breeding range is a little bit hard to pin down, but they certainly breed in many areas of Southern California. But the juveniles, um, again, are, are quite different. So a couple of lessons here, again, quite streaky. They retain at least enough of a hint of the head pattern that this pretty much screams lark sparrow by looking at the head. Uh, most juveniles will not show the rufous color on the crown and the auricular that the adults have. But another important thing to keep in mind, and John mentioned it earlier, is that this in the molt, the, the preformative molt or the molt out of juvenile plumage into formative plumage, the wing and tail feathers are retained. And of course, lark sparrows have that very distinctive uh, pattern of the white around the corners of the tail. And you're going to see that in the juveniles too. So it, it makes them quite distinctive. Um, the next bird is also a young lark sparrow, but a little bit odd in that it's retaining lots of heavy breast streaking and yet already has molted in chestnut in the auricular and the crown. So this is a, a less typical looking juvenile, but again, pretty clearly a lark sparrow and it's gonna have that very distinctive tail pattern. Um, this is not a bird you probably you'll see them away from the immediate breeding grounds in this plumage, but not long distances away. They're not going to migrate long distances. And of course, long, lark sparrows have pretty complicated movements and migrations anyway. They're not a simple long distance migrant, but they seem to just sort of congregate in different areas at different seasons. So again, lark sparrows, the juveniles are quite different from adults, but still pretty distinctive. Here's a bird you probably all know because it's become a fairly common breeding bird through much of the coastal slope of Southern California, whereas a couple decades ago, we would have considered them pretty much restricted to mountain forests. And again, the notion that the juveniles will retain or the, the wing and tail patterns will be the same throughout their first year, um, make this bird pretty easy to identify. There's only one sparrow we have in North America or one closely related group of sparrows with pure white, extensive outer tail feathers and more white in the uh, rectrices in from the outer ones. And that's of course the junco. So this is a juvenile Oregon dark-eyed junco uh, photographed in Ventura County, but you can see these in much of the LA basin, Orange County, San Diego. This bird has really expanded its breeding range. And this is a pretty recent phenomenon. Um, other than that, again, the typical streaky sparrow, it's got a pinkish bill and the distinctive tail pattern. And before we go on, uh, it's, it's obviously a junco, but John has a story to tell about an encounter with a bird like this. Yeah, it's embarrassing, but these are, it's illustrative of, um, you can get hoisted on your own distribution petard. Uh, you do not see juncos in this plumage away from the breeding grounds. Um, and um, as a result, then we don't really see juncos, oh, for the most part, till mid October. And they're really a winter species. So early September, once at the Fleming unit at Honey Lake, I looked up and looked at this sparrow with a bright pink bill and a blank face and an eye ring. And uh, thought, good God, what is that thing? I saw the streak, so I knew it was in juvenile plumage. The closest thing I could make was a juvenile field sparrow, because I think it wouldn't be a junco. And to be quite honest, I'd never really taken time to look at juvenile juncos. Um, 
So um, I got the camera, I wanted to get pictures, and then it flew, and I saw white outer tail feathers. And I thought, oh, it's a junco. But then I thought, why does it look like that? And then thought, well, could it be a hybrid? Anyway, I could just completely messed up the idea, ID rather, and uh, was completely bamboozled and uh, went off, sulked in the car and didn't want to look at it, look at it anymore. Actually, no, it was quite interesting. Um, but it had no business being, it was at least 20 miles from the nearest pine tree where it might have bred and just out in the sagebrush desert. So you can run across these things. I ran across a rufous crowned sparrow once with Matt, not in juvenile plumage, but at um, Galileo Hill, just on the lawn, Matt got a couple pictures that absolutely established the identification. It's the only stray rufous crowned I've seen uh, away from, well away from any area where they might breed. And it looks nothing like a California rufous crowned sparrow. It's quite gray underneath uh, as to the sub geographic origin, which subspecies it was having a clue. It's one of the bat says it's one of the rarest birds he's ever seen at Galileo Hill. So the point is, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, if you get something way, very significant records require very significant evidence. Always try to get photos to document whatever you believe you are seeing. I will just quickly go through a couple other species where the juveniles look quite different from adults, but again, they don't really pose an ID problem because you're not gonna see them like this away from breeding areas. Um, at least we wouldn't expect it. There's always exceptions. So here's a bird, the streaky bird, but if you look at the wing and tail pattern, the pet pattern on the tertials on the tail, um, the ID becomes pretty clear. This is a spotted toey. Juveniles are heavily streaked. Um, you see this, of course, on the breeding grounds. Of course, our spotted toys generally aren't migratory, but we have migratory spotted toys that come in, in the, into the mountains and the foothills and the deserts uh, from some distance away, and you won't see juveniles of those moving in. So a juvenile spotted toy, again, there's going to be adults feeding this bird or nearby. So it's not an ID issue. It's just if you're not familiar with it, you kind of do a double take. Uh, likewise, a very familiar California toy. So a typical adult on the right and the juveniles uh, a little bit different, buffy wing bars and a lot of streaking across the breast. But the same deal, you're not going to see these any significant different distance from the breeding areas. Um, not that towies really ever move much away from their areas of residence anyway, but it's just a, gives you a double take because it's a very different uh, looking pattern on it. So, and then finally related to the California towies is this bird that John was just talking about. And this, this, I tell you, I would just do a real double take if I saw that bird on the left. Bold eye ring, heavily streaked. Um, Till I kind of came to my senses and realized where I was. And these are, these are both, you know, from different areas, but these are both juvenile rufous crowned sparrows. Um, again, heavily streaked. Um, they've got the distinct dark male or streak, uh, the distinct eye ring. The habitat is generally pretty distinctive and that kind of skulking, you know, long tailed short wing sparrow with skulking habits. So it shouldn't pose an ID problem, but again, this heavily streaked juveniles just kind of, again, cause a double take if you're not used to seeing them. Um, as John pointed out, the Rufus Crown Sparrow he was talking about that he saw with Matt Heindel was not a juvenile, but illustrated that even when we think things don't move, they may move. Um, and his Junko shows that even when we say juveniles don't move away from the breeding grounds in certain species, Sometimes they do. So the exceptions are the fun part of birding, I suppose. Do you remember? So now we're going to switch back to John. Is going to just yes. Yeah, I had a comment on the rufous crown. Um, maybe Ed had it as as a quiz photo at the Central Valley Bird Symposium, but it was a juvenile rufous crown sparrow, and he had sent it to me uh, months months earlier, and I maybe said it was a juvenile rufous crown, but on the ID panel, I called it something else or I had no idea. Next thing it says, well, six months ago, you said it was a such and such. The trouble is getting <laughs> older, you, 
you don't remember. <laughs> you know, here I was looking at the same image. Uh, I'll try to remember these pictures in case anyone ever has it as a quiz. I've seen twice <laughs> juvenile rufous crown sparrows outside of where they breed, but it was only by about three miles. And of course, we, we haven't commented, Kimball, but, a, you know, they had a bell sparrow in Sacramento County, but they had a, a big fire as well, one of the big fires. So fires obviously can disperse birds, or we hope they do. Yeah. All right, John, you want to take over now? Sure. So we're, we're done with Rufus crowns. So white crown sparrows. Um, Zonotrichia is, is the one genus, you know, you know the Zonotrichia, white crown, white throated, golden crowned Harris is where the, the juvenile plumage is held only up on the breeding grounds. And before they migrate, they molt into what we called first basic or immature. The new lingo is formative. Um, and this is the way, of course, we see this is an adult. It, it's easy to tell the adults from the formative plumage. This is the widespread uh, subspecies found in West, over much of Western North America. Um, and Leucophrys, east of Hudson Bay, which is closely related, is the one found in Eastern North America. Um, but in any case, so you see adults and immatures and now the formative plumage is retained until just before they migrate, they then molt into a uh, plumage, which is basically identical visually to the adult. That candy corn colored bill uh, is a good identification feature for the subspecies uh, Gambolai in formative plumage. And also the, uh, from Orianta, the lateral crown stripes have a, a rufous cast. So we have some more juvenile plumaged white crowns. Kimball, you were, there we are. So San Mateo County, that's gonna be not a lie, typically with a dull yellow bill. And uh, was the one on the lower left from Pugetensis, perhaps? Are uh, those right? The uh, Pug upper right is Pugetensis. The, the lower, both lower birds are Orianta. Okay. So look at the, you might be able to see the difference in the lateral crown stripe color, more of a blackish brown or a dark chocolate brown, um, identifying them in, in juvenile plumage. It's often helpful to look at the adults that are feeding them. That's your first clue. But the bottom line, you're not going to see white crown sparrows in juvenile plumage in areas where they, away from areas where they breed. And of course the Orianth, the white crowns, the ones that nest out my window high up in the Sierra, uh, winter in West Mexico. They don't winter in California. Next image. So if, you, if you're in LA or area and wanna see juvenile white crowned sparrows, just drive up the coast of Morro Bay or you know the coast of um, northernmost, northwesternmost Santa Barbara County, San Luis Obispo County, and you'll see the nuttalai juveniles very commonly in late spring and early summer. Otherwise, the closest would be Orianta in the High Sierra, and of course, a very few in the high mountains of Southern California. They're called. Now we're going to switch gears again to another group. So, savanna sparrows. A very, very common uh, species in their own genus, Passerculus. Here's a, it's a good sparrow to learn. There are lots of things you hope to see that are streaky, uh, but the one to, to learn solid is the savanna. They could be gregarious. They're not very skulky. Uh, they may be in grass and you don't see them, but they flush up in the bushes and sit and look at you. 
uh, when you get near them. Um, some synonymize as one subspecies, all of the, most of the continental breeders, uh, they differ a little bit. Some are darker, some are paler. The, the darkest subspecies, which is genetically different is the uh, belding eye on the coast of Southern California, Northwest Baja, which is very heavily streaked. Um, the notable geographic difference on the East Coast is the one on uh, Sable Island, the breeder there, the uh, Princeps, the Ipswich Sparrow, which is distinctly pale. Next image. Oh, here, here we have the belling eye. Yeah, the belling oh, eye on oh. the right. Bell, you didn't, you both, didn't mention the subspecies of these. Right. So undoubtedly, um, well, the, the continental one, if you follow rising, uh, what's our widespread subspecies, Kimball? I'm blanking at the moment. Well, uh, Nevidensis. 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 That's the left-hand bird. The, the breeding one and, and belding eye. All savannas have a distinct postocular line connects to the eye almost gives the appearance of going through the lores too but at least a postocular line which is important from bears which we have a few pictures of and they, by the time they're migrating now i haven't looked that carefully but i don't see juvenile plumage savannas i guess we're going the other way um so we have um, the large-billed savanna sparrow, which is genetically pretty distinctive and vocally distinctive. Uh, I voted to split it the last time it came around. Um, but um, they breed at the mouth of the Colorado and down the west coast of Mexico related subspecies as far as northwest Sinaloa and a bit in uh, on the gulf side of, of Baja and you'll see the very big bill uh, and not much color in the eyebrow at all really none um, and they're grayish and not very particularly heavily streaked so post-breeding they come up uh, to the coast of Southern California, Central California, very small numbers. Uh, they disappeared for a few decades. And during that time, the place to see them was around the Salton Sea, uh, where it often would be right at the edge of the sea itself on the bric-a-brac, the, the roads, plus in the emergent salt cedar and was the indigo bush was uh, another, they'd be in their own habitat. Um, so I think the vote to split it, a majority, there's, there's more work that needs to be done. Um, I guess, I mean, it, it didn't convince the majority of the committee in any case to split them. And particularly, there needs to be more recordings exploring not only the song differences, but the call, contact notes. Next image. So this was the 1981 uh, Baird Sparrow that was found on in the cemetery by on Point Loma by Doug Willick and was around for several days and widely seen. It was a second state record. It looks much like a Savannah Sparrow. The bill's a little bigger. It's in its a genus shared with Henslow Sparrow, Centronix. Uh, Savannahs, remember they have the post ocular line. Uh, Baird's has these two dark spots in the rear of the auricular, but is otherwise uh, unpatterned in the, the face and somewhat of a less distinctive median crown stripe. This uh, Baird Sparrow was on, uh, I can't remember, the 1st of October possibly. It had some, the 
outer scapulars are already uh, formative or first basic and the row next to them heading towards the middle of the back or with that are very scaly, that row are fully juvenile feathers. So this is sort of a half and half deal. And some of these really secretive sparrows, I think we don't understand their, or at least it's not widely published, how quickly they get the formative plumage and how different it is from adults. We're not discussing Lacantes because we, mainly we don't have good images of the, some juvenile Lacotte sparrows, that photograph got terrible pictures of one in Furnace Creek Ranch in mid-October in full juvenile plumage. And there are other records like that. And yet others look virtually identical to the adults by at least by the end of October. So, so there's certainly much more to learn about the timing of when the, how many actually migrate in the juvenile plumage. So here's a Savannah to compare the face. And just go back and make a point on the uh, Emberizidae, the old world buntings. It appears just like our sparrows, most of the Emberizidae molt out of juvenile plumage uh, before they migrate. I'm, uh, I say that tentatively, I'm not sure. Uh, what I do know is the first palaces bunting that occurred in the UK was in full juvenile plumage, which really vexed making an identification. A palace, it was on Fair Isle um, off Scotland and the uh, closest palaces buntings breed to the UK is in uh, subarctic Russia, just west of the Urals. So European Russia and most of them breed well east of the Urals. So that bird migrated a long distance. One of the ones Paul Lehman found in uh, Gamble was in full juvenile plumage as well. Next image. Vesper sparrows. So we'll close on something unexciting, but um, Vesper sparrows are polytypic species with four named subspecies two of which occur in California. And I had always been curious about how you separate them. And it wasn't until I went down in January to the San Diego Natural History Museum that Phil Unit filled me in. The widespread Great Basin bird is Confinus, breeding east of the Sierra and the sagebrush and across much of Western North America um, and east of the Cascades. And then there's this Oregon Vesper Sparrow, which breeds um, west of the Cascades in Oregon, uh, like the Willamette Valley, the Rogue Valley, uh, and very locally in Western Washington. So it's just in the, covered in the bird species of special concern. Dick Erickson wrote the account. And most winter uh, around the San Joaquin Valley in central. California, Southern Sacramento Valley. Um, and it always been wondered, how do you tell them apart? And Phil said, well, they need to be, Phil Unit said, they need to be in fresh plumage. And dorsally, Confinus, if you look at the uh, left image, um, we, we presume the right one is Confinus and Morin, so not identifiable, but the, the um, it's a little browner in, Aphanus, the Oregon Vesper Sparrow, the bottom bird with slightly buffier edges. And um, then I think we have some images and trays. The bottom line was- Slide to just slow to load. There we are. So looking at that, I thought, got discouraged and thought, oh, I probably won't be identifying those in the field and yet alone the birds that I see and they're declining. You know, they're many fewer. They're just the counties around the Central Valley is where these, the Affinus winners you can find us mostly east of the Sierra. So we have a declining subspecies with um, 
and because they're so similar, they'll be hard to document uh, and sort of see how they peter out. So it's not all, I'd always been excited about learning how to tell these two apart. And after spending an hour or two with them, I thought, oh, well, I'm not there yet. <laughs> but it, oh, well. the importance of, you know, having a specimen that compared to birds in a tray. And the importance of having a curated collection. So we had lots of people help us on this. It's typically so many of the pictures are from Larry. And uh, we sort of explored some different topics with sparrows. I got a lot of the photos came from folks who uploaded them into eBird that are in the Macaulay Library, and it's a wonderful resource. Although I got to tell you, in looking through thousands of pictures of these various sparrows, I sure found a lot of misidentified ones um, in the photo queue in eBird. So if anybody has a lot of time on their hands, you can do what Tony Lukering does and just go through all the photos and find and flag all the misidentified ones. But anyway, we thank everybody who helped out with photos. And um, again, it's just sort of a hodgepodge of topics, but we hope that we've given you a little more appreciation of juvenile plumages and when and where you're likely to see them and when it's likely to be a pro ID problem away from the breeding range and and so on. And I don't know if we've got any questions in the Q and A. Um, I don't know, Mark or David, or if somebody wants to fill us in with those. Uh, we're running a little late, but we could probably answer a couple of them. So, sure. Thank our you hosts so much. Say. No, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for the the, the webinar. Um, let's see if we have questions in the Q and A. I do see a couple. Uh, stop here. sharing my screen now. I see, I see a couple here. So Lance wrote, um, are canescents the only subspecies of bell sparrow that moves up slope after breeding? What about belline? Kimball? I don't know well, how much we know about that. The belline, of course, nests at higher elevations, so they don't have as far up to move. And a, a, a kind of a converse question is how much do they move downslope away from the breeding area? So my general thought is they don't move much at all. Um, but I think people like you will help answer that question because we don't really know, but we know that Canescens moves a great deal into habitats that are very much unlike the, their breeding habitats. How far is Zuma Canyon, Kimball? I don't know how close to the coast that was. Uh, where would the nearest breeders be? I know over oh, by I think they, they've declined a lot in the Santa Monica Mountains, but I think they breed in the up, they have bred in the uppermost parts of the Zuma Creek drainage. So it's not that far away. Okay. Uh, probably a few more of them in the far western Santa Monica's. They used right. to breed as far east as Topanga Canyon, but I don't think they have for many years. The, when I lived in Encino, I only once ever saw a bell sparrow around Encino Reservoir. No, you just saw a sage sparrow. You had no idea what a bell sparrow was, probably. <laughs> That's undoubtedly true. Um, there's a, a couple more uh, comment and a question. So John Burstner said that, uh, pointed out that there's a record of a Rufus Crown Sparrow from Apollo Park. Um, so on the subject of uh, Rufus Crown Sparrow at uh, Galileo. Um, was, it was it photographed? Uh, yes, it's with yes, photo. Sir. Yeah. So well, that's a great. Uh, look at that. All right, and then uh, Lance asked another question. He said, "What's the evidence that Timberline sparrows breed between Southern Yukon and Southern Alberta slash British Columbia?" Um. Well, that's an interesting question. I guess I'd have to look at Birds of Canada. Um. Uh, and and see, so the Lance, the it's discontinuous. I mean, well, they're at right. They're if at you look, and, yeah, if you look at the range map in your latest edition of the National Geographic Guide, it shows us 
a gap hundreds of miles long between the area near Banff and, you know, the B.C. Yukon border. Wow. I wonder how mm. carefully that's explored. That's a that's a fascinating the Canadian Rockies there. Uh, if you go from south to north, you know, we're we're your point's very valid, but for instance at uh, glacier it goes from um, the percentages of Oriantha and Gamble Eye White Crowns change as you move north through the Canadian Rockies and the number of hybrids. And everything they think in Montana is Alticola American Pippets where the breeding plumage is unstreaked, the Rocky Mountain one. And yet alone at some point in the Canadian Rockies, Alticola disappears. And it was really hard to figure out where. Uh, is it possible, Lance, that there's just not a lot of detailed exploration about the timberline? Uh, you know, the I roads to the map. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised at all if people just haven't checked very much. Yeah. Well, you're a you're a Mainer. You haven't hiked up those peaks and ridges <laughs> and uh, uh, the Canadian Rockies there. Uh, not recently, no. <laughs> you've, you've, you've jogged me now to ask i've never been to alberta um, but i need to start there's an alberta breeding bird atlas too but paul would have picked up if there's any evidence of timberline sparrows farther north and birds of british columbia too but paul has both those references good question so, Inadequate. Um, so well so, i'm sorry to interrupt you john so uh, i there are no more uh, questions or comments related to sparrows so um you know, we're, we're at about an hour and a half, so maybe it's time to uh, wrap it up here. Thank you both very much. Mark, any other comments? No, that's it. Uh, just thank you very much. And, um, you, and, and we hope to see everybody for uh, the next webinar. And um, this one I did, you know, should be uh, recorded and put on YouTube. Um, so for, those of you um, uh, who who you know need to you know rewatch it again and you know go back and study your juvenile sparrows, um, it should be up there to see again. Don't so. report a juvenile Lincolns in August. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to upset Kimball. I just looked up the Phil Carnell photograph, the Rufus Crown Sparrow, or maybe David Ellsworth also at Apollo Park. Uh, the photos in eBird, it's, it shows a little bit of streaking on it. So it's, you know, a, a hatchier bird and it looks pretty gray, but um, John, you'll want to look at that photo. So yeah, there, they, there is an interesting record of a wanderer. Thanks for pointing that out, John. Berzer. It's great to find exceptions to break the rules and it's even better when they're substantiated with evidence. <laughs> Speaking of evidence, what, another evidence question, what's the evidence that Oriantha breeds somewhere in the transverse or peninsular ranges here in Southern California? The San Bernardinos. Oh yeah, they're, they're pretty easy to find in parts above Big Bear, or at least they used to be up around, um, oh, what's Bluff Lake, that area, and then up on Mount San Gorgonio. Really, as low as Bluff Lake, huh? Yeah, I don't know about currently, but they used to. Huh. We, um, we got another question from uh, Liga Ozens, um, and it was, uh, John, have you explored the identity of quote unquote sage sparrows breeding along Death Valley Road uh, between Owens Valley and Death Valley? Uh, in other words, um, oh, heading over the um, through the Panamint Valley and then uh, over Town Pass and into Death Valley. No, um, look at it in a, it, it's all detailed very carefully in Birds of Arizona that in terms of movement, the first movement is uh, Canescence moves earlier in the fall and earlier in the spring. And if you look at carefully at the sagebrush 
Sparrow Records, and they're getting to, it's getting to be a slight pattern well outside of areas of normal occurrence. Many of them are late in late October, even into November. And one of them we looked for the next day, it was at Central Valley Bird Symposium, almost Thanksgiving. And it was a one day stray uh, out there in Eastern San Joaquin County. So the sagebrush sparrows seem to be pretty hardy and are late movers. Uh, in, in Arizona, once you get east of Phoenix, they pretty much all the winter birds are sagebrush. There are locally breeding canessens that do extend into Southern Nevada barely. So it's complicated um, as, to, as to what breeds and where. But my answer to Liga, I need to do more exploring or certainly more researching. Okay, I think we've exhausted the questions. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, and Thanks. see you for the next webinar. Thank you, Thanks. Johnny. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye, everybody. Bye,